I am pleased to introduce Dr. Steve Wendells, our first presenter today. Um, Dr. Wendells is a wildlife biologist at Voyagers National Park in Minnesota. He has been a professional wildlife biologist since 1996 and is certified through the Wildlife Society. In addition to long-term studies of beaver ecology, he has conducted research and monitoring uh, on moose, white-tailed deer, wolves, muskrats, eagles, loons, cormorants, and more. He is the 2023 recipient of the Distinguished Moose Biologist Award, the Wildlife Society's Jim McDonough Award in 2021, and the National Park Service's Director's Award for Natural Resource Research in 2014. Please welcome Dr. Windells. Thank you. Uh, appreciate the introduction. Uh, let's see, going to share my screen. So the title, again, is um, Beavers and the Creation of Habitat and, and Increasing Biodiversity. But we all know the title should really be Beavers are the answer. The question is irrelevant. Hashtag uh, selfless promotion. This is the bumper sticker that I made many years ago and has been um, slowly circulating its way around the world. So let's play this game here a little bit. Um, so when I say the question, I want you all to say to yourself or to your office mate or or, um, or text, uh, text your mother um, the answer. Okay, the trade of what animal basically fueled the westward expansion of the United States? Everybody's got that one. Uh, what is far and away the most handsome rodent in our solar system? Okay. Everybody's saying it to themselves, they're out loud, right? What is the only animal that can break the deadlock in Congress and pass a clear appropriations bill to keep the government fully operational after October 1st? I think we, we know there's only one person or one uh, animal we can call. Um, so <clears throat> Emily gave a great uh, overview uh, last week about beaver engineering and all the ways they do it and, um, and all the ecosystem services they provide. So I'm just gonna give and just a few slides here um, giving just some really quick background about these things again. So beavers um, build dams to create ponds. And uh, let's see here, I'm going to try that. Um, and beavers don't just like water, they like stable water. So this is why they build dams. And some of these dams are very large. Here's one that's probably seven, eight feet tall. Uh, here's another one. This one's about 12, almost 12 feet tall. This is the famous uh, Helms Deep Dam here in Voyagers National Park. Um, that's me on top for scale, and I'm a, I'm a very tall person, so that's a huge dam. Uh, so a typical pond site, after they construct this dam here at the at the outflow, um, you can again have, here's the lodge and the food cache and the canals. And we again talked about the canals last week, the the, the, uh, the channel or the tunneling the beavers do and digging the canals, which is sort of an understudied aspect of their engineering you know, so far. Um, and again, part of the reason why they build these ponds, build the dams, and create a pond, to create the stable water level. So here's here is um, uh, a side view uh, of a beaver lodge. Okay, so here's your classic, typical beaver lodge. Um, there's the underwater entrance. Um, you can see the food pile, the food cache. Obviously, the farther north you get, the the more important and the bigger that food cache gets. And the farther south you get, for example. Um, Alabama or, or the Gulf states, you know, they uh, often sometimes don't have any food cash, but in northern places like this, this is what, what gets them through the five or six months of winter. So the lodge provides protection from predators. This is a key one. Once again, they're, they, these lodges um, built with mud and sticks, they're in the ones they freeze, they're like cement, really hard for anything to get at them. Protection from the elements. Um, location of the food cache. And again, this is an underappreciated aspect here that basically water in the wintertime that's, um, is usually just slightly above freezing, 33, 34 degrees. And essentially it acts like a heat pump. And so, um, again, even if it's minus 30 and minus 40 Fahrenheit, um, it will be above freezing in the lodge. Uh, just again, some brief natural history. Ter beavers are highly territorial. They're monogamous, but are they? It's um, in, in, up for debate in some ways. Um, they live in family groups. They have a breeding pair, the kids, the one-year-olds. Sometimes you get some two and three-year-olds in the family groups as well. And in dense populations, you have delayed dispersal. 
very similar to European beaver in ecology and behavior. They're totally different species. They have different numbers of chromosomes. They can interbreed. Uh, again, they're all the same, except uh, European beavers wear nicer shoes and own less guns. Uh, beavers are herbivorous. You'd be surprised how many people still think that beavers eat fish or clams or whatever else. Again, they are almost uh, strict herbivores. And, uh, and again, an underappreciated part of their biology is that um, they eat a lot of aquatic plants. And we did some uh, really cool work here about 10 years ago now, um, summarizing some of that. Um, okay, so yeah, now coming back around to thinking about beavers as ecological engineers and even keystone species, and what do these what do these terms mean? So um, again, the internet is a strange place. So if you want to find a picture of a beaver wearing braces driving uh, driving a train engine with a tooth on it, you can find that. But that's not exactly what I meant by engineers here. So ecosystem engineers. Um, uh, again, as Emily highlighted last week, create or modify habitats by causing physical state changes in biotic or abiotic materials. In keystone species, there are species with a disproportionate effect on ecosystem whose removal can lead to collapse. And again, this is based on this concept of a keystone in, uh, in a stone arch. If you remove that keystone, the whole arch collapses. So um, we all know about this game Six Degrees of Kevin Bacon. I know we've all played it. Some of you probably played it on the way to work this morning. Um, where again, with just six connections, you can connect any, any Hollywood person to, to Kevin Bacon, okay? Um, you can do the same thing with beaver, Six Degrees of American Beavers, and instead of actors, it's all of the ecosystem processes and functions and, and uh, roles that they play um, in our ecosystem. Uh, it's a game I like to play here. I, I challenge people to name something in the, you know, some ecological function or species or whatever, and I, and I can connect it back to beavers and fish species. And that's weird. And their dam building, their foraging, their lodge, and their cash building, and also uh, beavers and prey. Um, so beavers, um, again, as, as ecosystem engineers and, um, and their effects on biodiversity and all of these other things, this has been, um, been lots of papers and books that have summarized this work um, very well over the years. And I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to go and give you a whole overview of, of all of these potential things that have been um, talked about for beavers, both American and European beavers over the, um, across the globe. So instead, I'm just going to focus on what I've been doing here at Voyager's National Park for the last 20 years, specific to beavers as creators of wildlife habitat and, and what that means for biodiversity. So here's Voyagers National Park. This is in uh, northern Minnesota, right on the uh, Ontario border. Um, you know, so we share almost 70 miles of border with Ontario and Canada. It is the only national park in Minnesota. Um, and it's primarily, we call ourselves a water-based park um, because that's the main mode of transportation. We don't really have any road. People come here and uh, either we're using car boats or cruise and kayaks and do a lot of camping. And, and uh, fishing and hiking next to Okay, there are a lot of beavers in Voyagers National Park. This is, I described um, um, this park as sort of you know, the, the, the mecca for, for beavers in the United States. It's the highest known densities in the United States. There are certain places in Canada that have uh, higher densities of beavers, but in terms of the lower 48, um, this is it. And um, the densities, here are at least two to ten times higher than what have been measured almost anywhere else in Minnesota. Um, so there's so many beavers here, in fact, that it almost should be a theme park just for beavers. So yeah, this is just an idea that has come to me from time to time. Uh, if there's any producers out there, you know where to find them. But here, uh, so what I want to show you now is I'm just going to walk you through this this really great work that uh, Carol Johnson and Bob Naiman and some of her collaborators did back starting back in the 80s, um, where they picked again this spot in Voyagers National Park with a known very high density of beavers, and they went back and they looked at um, aerial photos that were available, and they could track through time um, as beavers recolonized um, this part of the park called the Cabotopia Peninsula. And as their populations expanded, again, we can now watch um, their influence on this landscape increase over time. 
And it's just, um, again, uh, many, some of you who are on this um, webinar have probably seen me give this time series before, but those, for the first, those who are seeing it for the first time, it always is a little bit idle. Okay, so 1927 was the first available photos that, that um, we had for your crappy black and white air photos taken as part of the border survey, but at that time, basically, um, very few beavers on the landscape. And you can see from the from the uh, that time series in the upper right, there are little red dot sort of tracks where the population was. You know, very very few beavers out there. They'd all been basically trapped out. And here we fast forward 1940. Um, now 1% of the landscape has been affected by beavers. These are either active beaver pods or or um, variations of uh, beaver affected environments. So um, old ponds or beaver meadows or flooded with um, shrublands, all those different categories of so, uh, beaver affected wetlands. 1948, again, this is now we're really in this sharp um, increase in population size. 4% impounded, 1961, there's 10%, 72, we're at 11%, 81, 12%, 1990, 13% in the last time we, uh, we looked at this. Um, was in 2005 again 13 percent so uh impounded again it's just it's a it's just a really this was kind of they were the first ones to really do this and it's just a really great case study and what you have when you add and subtract beavers from the landscape so again if you just think about this so what the, what the capital of peninsula that's this big chunk in the park looked like from 1940s basically with very few beavers versus what it looked like in 1990 after just 50 years of, of um, beaver recovery and what the landscape looks like now um, is probably very similar to what it would have looked like again in the 1500s um, before the, uh, the fur trade era started in the years when populations went in the tank. So here's another example. This is uh, just a little snip from the northeastern part of uh, Voyager's National Park. That's Ryan Lake on the left um, there. And so in 1940, again, this was mostly, mostly forested. Again, we jumped to 2013, and uh, again, here's this landscape mosaic of of, uh, of beaver wetlands with uh, the standing water in them, with old ponds that um, are now um, some sort of form of beaver meadow, or again, um, things with wet soils or uh, flooded um, woodlands. Um, again, a whole mosaic of, uh, that was created here just by beaver activity. So here's another look at this. Um, again, just to show you at various spatial scales what this what this means in terms of creating a diverse um, a diverse um, landscape with different habitat types that might be appealing for all kinds of different um, wildlife. And one of the things that um, that is common here again in, in the area that has had persistent beaver um, Activity and foraging is now you have sort of this bathtub ring of conifers that you find around a lot of these, a lot of these ponds, conifers that beavers really aren't eating. And you have to go further in to find the deciduous species like aspen and birch, for example. And again, as Emily talked about last week, you, again, whatever, even if you zoom down now just to the spatial scale of an individual pond, you can see the heterogeneity that happens at the pond scale as well. So you have uh, even, so here's all the pond with lots of, um, um, aquatic vegetation growing in it, things like water shield and those sorts of things. And now beavers, of their activity through their digging and their feeding are cleared out these little these little donut holes around their lodges, and that you can see um, the little channels where they um, where they've been swimming or digging. And again, now beaver activities have created this heterogeneity even at this scale, and which creates obviously that much more opportunities for other animals to exploit. Um, so what I'm going to talk about again for for the next um number of slides here is is a is a summary of, of this chapter from this uh the book that carol wrote um uh, beavers and boil ecosystem engineers uh this is the last chapter in the book beavers as engineers of wildlife habitat and it was really just summarizing everything we knew um here at voyages national park going back to 1973 when the park was established um to up to 2016 when the book was published about um uh, various wildlife species that interact with beaver created environments here. Okay, so uh, one of the first ones we'll talk about, and one of the ones that I've uh, focused a lot on in the last 20 years, is uh, moose. 
So beaver, thinking about beaver ponds as moose habitat, moose require uh, heterogeneous landscapes. They need all kinds of different uh, cover types and vegetation um, types to fit their different life history needs, whether that's foraging or um, thermal cover or escape cover from predators, um, uh, calving areas, etc. So um, and beaver ponds can provide some of these things. They're very um, escape from predators, obviously. It's pretty hard. Moose are great swimmers, and it's pretty hard for a wolf or a wolf pack to um, swim and keep up with a moose and kill it in the water. So, the moose in the water is actually much uh, less vulnerable to wolf predation than the outside. Also, escape from biting insects. And, um, there's lots of uh, there's called moose flies that are just um, really nasty and uh, drive moose crazy, and they spend a lot of time in ponds um, in some places just to escape uh, when the flies get down. Um, moose are adapted to aquatic feeding. Um, they, this is a Canadian thing, so no offense to Canadians, but they sometimes call them swamp donkeys. Um, they have these long legs and have this long snout. Um, again, it's the adaptation for um, the part for feeding on uh, on aquatics, both emergent and submergent aquatics. And um, some of the work from Isle Royal was the one that documented this, Paul Peterson and, and um, his colleagues uh, moving, observing moose diving as deep as 5.5 meters and staying to submerge for 50 seconds to forage on um, aquatic plants in in uh, wetlands out there. Uh, so <clears throat> I had a student working with me from Lakehead University, Brian McLaren was his um, was his advisor, and um, where we looked at beaver ponds as foraging habitat for moose. So this was an important um, thing for in Ontario was they were working trying to work this into their um, forest plans about retaining beaver ponds and potentially moose habitat. So um, for a couple of summers, David was here swimming around in um, beaver ponds. And as I'll allude to later, um, uh, that was, it was interesting watching him um, change over the course of those two summers. Uh, so we measured depth in all these different ponds that we had, the study ponds, and mean depth was 1.13 meters. and so. Which meant moose could readily forage throughout all of the portions of the pond. It was just like these beaver ponds almost everywhere was a pretty good spot, potential spot for moose to forage. Um, we also measured um, richness and biomass of, of these aquatic plants and foods that we thought that we know are moose food. Uh, there's two to four times higher richness and biomass of these moose foods in beaver ponds and in lake wetlands, for example. So really, again, potentially rich areas for for uh, for supporting moose. And the richness of plant richness um, was greater in young and medium age ponds. By the time they got to the old ponds, they sort of had this quote unquote climax stage that were just um, less diverse. There's greater richness in larger ponds than smaller ponds, and I won't get into why that was. But um, so one other thing that we were interested in in terms of moose, there are large um, dark furred animal. Um, and their range basically, we're almost at the southern edge of their range here, right in northern Minnesota. Um, and that southern part of the range is, is, um, is uh, limited in large part because of uh, their adaptation to cold climates, not warm climates like they have. So, moose, anytime they're moving around, again, they have this complex um, heat budget that they're trying to, to navigate. So, we thought about, um, again, trying to hear our voyagers think about. Um, what's the thermal environment for moose. And one of the interesting things we found is that these open areas where um, beavers um, had removed the trees or where there were no trees or through various um, activities, these open areas um, could be as hot as eight degrees Celsius and warmer in, uh, during midday in the summer than closed canopy forests. So um, what that means, if we think about this sort of on a landscape scale now, so um, this is, Again, a third, essentially the thermal regime for this Tabatoga Peninsula that we took on just the average hot, the hottest part of the day and the hottest part of the year, just to give us sort of the maximum amount of um, difference here, just for, for example. So in this case, uh, the red areas are the warmest and the dark green areas are the coolest. And again, in all these cases, a lot of these red areas are beaver um, complexes. These are areas of the other. Uh, beavers have come in and flooded and killed the trees and uh, removed the overstory. Um, and now essentially creating these very warm areas. 
So if you're a moose, and now you're going to have to go out in the middle of the day, um, you have to make some decisions about um, what that means for your own heat budget now. So here's an example. So this is midday. Again, this is just one example for illustration purposes. And those red areas, these are all beaver ponds, basically. All the red stuff is, is uh, beaver ponds, and the dark red stuff is forest. So here in midday, this is the hottest part. But now, here's the interesting part of it. If we switch now to midnight, so 12 hours later, the, essentially the coolest part of the day, these areas now um, are cooler than in, in the forest because it's just easier for heat to dissipate. So it's uh, one of the things that we looked at is our moose moving back and forth between uh, these open areas um, during going into the closed canopy forest during the day and then coming out into these open areas, a lot of them beaver wetlands at night to cool off. We also thought about beaver ponds as thermal habitat, so the water itself. The moose go in and use these areas to cool themselves down. Um, we had temperature loggers put out in a number of ponds. And um, the story is complex and it's unfinished, um, but one of the interesting things here, so this is mean uh, uh, maximum air temperature that we measured um, adjacent to these ponds over the course of uh, three months, one summer. Um, so that uh, the top line there is the maximum air temperature, the bottom line is the minimum air temperature. And you can see it varies quite a bit on a day-to-day -day basis. So the interesting thing is when we measured water temperature, um, the uh, the maximum water temperature in these things was pretty close to the maximum air temperature. So, um, so during um, the middle of the day, for example, um, uh, when the water is essentially the same temperature as the air, is that really a, um, an opportunity for moose to cool down? Then, and again, where it gets more complicated is because the high specific heat of water means warm water might actually cool more than warm air. Again, if you think about it, um, if you sit in 85, if you sit in 85 degrees air temperature, you're you're going to be sweating. If you sit in an 85 degree swimming pool for enough hours, eventually you're going to get hypothermia. That's just the way heat transfer works. Again, this stuff is unpublished, so um, I will be on um, the next episode of Porter's Agency Biologist in season 20, where I think a lot of you can emphasize we're really good at collecting data and sometimes not so good at getting out the door. I think if you look way in the back on the left, you can see that that's where the folders are for this study. Um, all right, one other thing, um, interesting thing that we looked at, this was not um, the focus of this, but we were interested in understanding about parasites of moose, um, both uh, liver fluke and meningeal worm, um, which the meningeal worm has been in the news recently because of some work that's been done um, up in Grand Portage about understanding sex of meningeal worm on the moose decline. But one of the interesting things is that uh, for liver flukes, the snails that are the intermediate hosts for liver flukes live in wetlands. And obviously beavers have now created lots more wetlands here um, in this park than there were 100 years ago, for example. And what does that mean for the risk of um, moose getting liver flukes? Um, it's again, under, we still don't quite know what the answer is, but it raises an interesting question. Uh, Beavers and gray wolves. There's been a lot of work done here in the last um, 10 years on, on wolves and, and wolf behavior and um, how they prey on beavers. Again, those of you who may follow the Voyager's Wolf Project um, um, in more recent years have you know, kept up on that stuff. But um, beavers are, again, one of the main prey items for wolves, especially in the summertime. 50% of their diet um, can be um, fried to beavers. And wolves will use beaver ponds and meadows as travel corridors, especially in winter. So again, just thinking about beavers creating habitat, not to the prey themselves, but even just creating habitat for wolves that facilitates their movements for whether it's um, preying on beavers themselves or preying on other things like beaver. Uh, wolves also will den and abandon beaver lodges. We have a couple examples of that from here, which is always fun and the um, um, obligatory photos of wolf pups that I managed to shoehorn in here, but um, in rendezvous sites, so wolves actually um, love to use these beaver meadows as rendezvous sites to spend most of their time on these sites in June and August, through August and stash the pups here while they're out hunting. These are open spaces and tall grass. It seems like they're great um, places for predator going instead of those young pups when, they're, when they've been left uh, while, they all, while the adults are out foraging. Uh, obviously, lots of other mammals we use uh, beaver created wetlands. Some of these will not have surprised muskrats and otters and mink, coons, especially bears. 
Um, and bear, there are um, examples here from voyagers of uh, bears using abandoned beaver lines and, and winter dens, lots of other small mammals. Um, so I'm going to go a little faster here in that 24 minutes in. So um, bats is another one. All seven species of bats here in voyagers have been documented using beaver ponds. And so bats are attracted to the forest openings near water sources where they like a high abundance and diversity of flying insects. And exfoliating bark on tree bulls provides excellent roosting habitat. And bats or a beaver activity creates all of these kinds of things. So uh, there definitely is um, a lot of it. Uh, that's part of that reason for why uh, bats are often highly affiliated with these beaver created weapons. Same sort of concept, woodpeckers and cavity nesters. Anytime um, you come in and you flood an area and you fill standing trees, like in the photo there, uh, these trees are going to start to break down. And this is just great. Um, foraging habitat for woodpeckers and, and also for cavity nesting. Um, here's an interesting one. Trumpeter swans were reintroduced in Minnesota in 1986. Um, and uh, again, I, should, I came here in Voyagers in 2003. And um, over the 20 years that I've been here, the number of uh, trumpeter swans that we see using uh, the park, but mostly during migration, it's just gone crazy. But of all the breeding, the known breeding attempts that we've had here in the park over the last uh, 20 years, all of them have, have been in beaver ponds. Um, this is just these areas that swans really seem attracted to. We have this anecdotal, but again, it's um, it's, uh, it's illuminating in some ways. Great blue herons, um, same thing, 100% of the rookeries in Voyagers National Park that were documented from 1973 to 2013. So this is 31 rookeries that we had been monitoring, park staff had been monitoring since 1973. All of them were in beaver created wetlands. And again, this um, in this case, um, what often would happen with beavers would um, flood um, black ash lowlands and those standing black ash trees would die and then they just were great um, nest substrate for, for great blue herons. They really like these. Osprey is another one. So we had almost a 40 year record of looking at osprey nests here in the park, and uh, more than 80% of the nests were in beaver and common. And part of this was that um, bald eagles had increased during that same time, and there was some competitive interactions that we think bald eagles sort of chased ospreys out of the lake habitats, and then ospreys moved inland, and the next best thing was these beaver and common. So, in the absence of those beaver and common, I'm not sure if we would have had very many ospreys at all. Uh, so here's um, how long do these dead trees persist? And this is a little bit anecdotal because it's kind of hard to find this uh, information. But so uh, once um, the wetland gets flooded, and now you have these standing dead trees, how long do these trees stand there and provide habitat for again, even nesting, nesting substrate for herons or osprey or even foraging habitat for other ones? So being able to look back at some air photos um, and some other evidence that we had, uh, we had six ponds where we could find some evidence going back um, 25 years or more. And six out of the six ponds had at least 30 dead trees spanning up to 25 years, which is pretty a long time ago. Um, and in at least three cases, I'm sorry, in at least half of these cases, at least three standing dead trees and a few ponds up to 66 years after creation. So um, that footprint that is left by beavers after creating that pond, again, can persist for quite a while and creating this habitat opportunity for some of these birds in particular. Uh, so now again, if we think about a beaver pond, you know, at that smaller scale, and this is the heterogeneity you see. So here's dead trees in the littoral zone over there where you might have some submerging uh, plants and floating weed plants in the shrub zone, in the emergent zone, the beaver meadows. So these are all different now sort of habitat types created in this one pond. And for birds in particular, you're going to have different birds that are, um, are going to like some of these different zones more than others. Um, so we found 77 species of birds using beaver created wetlands. That's almost 30% of the breeding and visiting bird species at the park. Um, amphibians and turtles, this is no brainer. Everybody knows this one. Obviously these things don't like to use wetlands. Um, but what I want to talk about here is there's um, a student, a PhD student at the University of North Dakota named Alan Skaman. He has probably the coolest name ever as far as a wildlife person might go. Uh, but he's looking at amphibian and invertebrate communities um, in beaver created wetlands. So we've got 55 different wetlands with different sizes and ages. So he just finished uh, his fourth season of the data collection. This, he's going old school. It's just Talon by himself. He doesn't have any field assistance. He wants to do this. Um, 
sort of, uh, um, he wanted to create a project that he could do just with him and be by himself, uh, just using acoustic recorders for the amphibian uh, work and then dip nets for this invertebrate community. So, um, be looking for some of these um, results from this stuff coming out in the next year as we finish this up. Um, so, similar to that other student, David Morris, what I watched over the two years that Dave was here and then uh, with Talon is that um, each year that they spend engrossed and swimming around in beaver ponds, they start to look more and more like beavers. And I Pretty sure that Talon actually chewed that tree down here last year. That was one of the last things that he did. So, it's overall, what we found is um, 124 terrestrial vertebrate species used um, beaver, beaver created habitats here in Voyager's National Park. Um, that's 38% of, of the total extant vertebrates. I didn't just talk about, I didn't include fish in this. That's all other uh, work that was done by Ike Schlosser here from UND, if you're interested. But, um, but it always makes me think of this this cover from the New Yorker where all of these wildlife species living happily together here in the one beaver pond. But um so the take the take home that I want you to have from this again is we go back to 1940 and we have this landscape of low beaver density. Um and again go to 1990 or even to the present day with this landscape of high beaver density and what the the um the difference between those two, and again, we can go back and think about um, what that may have meant for all these other species that I just talked about in terms of uh, either their presence or their abundance or their breeding success or all of those things. So over the last um, 70 years, 90 years, whatever, wildlife diversity certainly has increased here in the park as a direct result of beaver activity. So I'm right at 30 minutes and I'm gonna try to wrap up. I think I only have maybe four or five more slides. I apologize for talking fast, but um, I want to try to capture a lot. So here is, um, this is uh, a beaver pond. You can see the little load hanging dam in the front and there's a beaver lodge in the background. This is in Tierra del Fuego down in South America in Chile. And these are in beavers um, uh, in, um, released from fur farms back in the 50s and now are this ecological catastrophe um, in parts of, um, the Tierra del Fuego in Chile and Argentina. But, so I was there um, last year, um, which was amazing. I got to see beavers in Tierra del Fuego, but in a beaver pond, there were two Chilean flamingos. So I dare anyone out there to top the top of this. <laughs> Do you see any flamingos in a beaver pond here in North America? Um, I would love to hear about it. So, so far I'm winning. All right, last thing I want to talk about is beavers also build lodges in large lakes. And I've spent a lot of research um, effort over the last 20 years focusing on this. So um, again, 40% of the park is large lakes. Some of these lakes are huge. Um, uh, Rainy Lake is one of the biggest, the 60th biggest lake in the world. This is a huge environment with a lot of shoreline um, The beavers will exploit. They don't build dams, but they'll build their lodges on the shores of these lakes um, and do all their same beaver stuff. But again, what you have, um, it has been talked about before is, um, if you think about again, these beaver lodges themselves as now habitat for other things, either because animals are gonna use them for, uh, for roosting or loafing um, or resting, or you have now all of this wood piled up uh, either for the lodge or for the food cache that now um, at various stages becomes habitat for other things, aquatic macro vertebrates, small fish, et cetera, et cetera. So, uh, here's the distribution of beaver lodges over a 14 year period. Um, uh, just on the big lakes, all those little yellow dots are lodges that I've documented um, during this 14 year period of the study that I'll talk about. Um, and one of the interesting things is there's various hotspots now um, of where there's these lots of these clusters of lots of beaver lodges. And some of these lakes, like Rainy Lake and Manicum Lake, are very um, lakes with low productivity. And so now you have biological hotspots created essentially by beaver activity. Um, so one other example, um, so beaver lodges as muskrat habitat. So this is something that I started, started to notice when I was started working with beavers here 20 years ago is how often I would see muskrats swimming in and out of beaver lodges. Um, and this is beaver lodges that are occupied by beavers and beaver lodges that have also been abandoned. So, um, muskrats and beavers seem to have, form some kind of detente where they tolerate each other um, inside 
these beaver lodges, mostly because they're not eating, um, their diets don't overlap that way. So we had a study where we put game cameras up because we wanted to sort of document how frequently this would happen, beaver lodge in this muskrat habitat. Um, and I've got lots of cool videos of muskrats swimming around, coming in and out of beaver lodges. So in this camera study, which is not published yet, but muskrats were more than two times like to use beaver lodges on random sites. So again, these beaver lodges um, were um, great getting habitat essentially for muskrats rather than them building their own lodges. They would take advantage of one of these um, um, hundreds and hundreds of beaver lodges that are uh, various stages that are in the um, that are here on the park. And in another case, we had a translocation study where uh, we were moving uh, muskrats around and they had transmitters because we were doing another experiment. Um, and the survival rates of those muskrats that used beaver lodges were higher than those that did not. So that was a really interesting finding that we had that just a couple of years ago. So um, this is a shot of a beaver swimming, and I don't remember what I was going to say about it, but I'm sure it was um, going to be some iffy way for me to summarize all this, but maybe it'll come to me later. So um, just want to acknowledge again all of the folks that have worked with me here at the park, either park employees or university collaborators and more um, on various components of this stuff. So I'm at 35 minutes. So what I'm going to do now is here's my shameless um, self-promotion. So I'm writing a novel um, tentatively called Being Bruce um, about where the protagonist is Bruce and Bruce may or may not be me or at least what my inner thoughts are. So um, and when this is published and I'm famous, I promise I will still talk to you all. And with that, I'm happy to take any questions. Well, that was just lovely, Steve. Um, we do have a couple of questions in the 